Welcome everyone. We'll get started here in just a minute. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the first meeting for the Rural HP Vaccination Learning Community. On behalf of the American Cancer Society and the National HP Vaccination Roundtable, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today, whether that's live or via recording in the future. Today's meeting is just the beginning of our 10-month journey together. During today's call, we will be setting the stage for our program and why we are focusing efforts on increasing HPV vaccinations in rural communities. As you may know, 57 million Americans call rural communities their home. There are many definitions of what encompasses, encompasses a rural community. Some may say less than 50,000, others say communities of less than 2,500. Either way, we know that individuals living in rural communities are at much higher risk for HPV-related cancers, and st statistics show significantly lower HPV vaccination coverage than individuals living in urban and suburban areas. A one-size-fits-all approach will not work for all of our rural America, but many of your communities do embody similar strengths and challenges, in which we are going to explore over the next 10 months. We have built this program using quality improvement as the forefront to explore areas of opportunity and use evidence-based interventions to increase HPV vaccines across rural America. Not only do we hope you will gain um, and hear promising practices, but talk through challenges to increasing HPV vaccinations to help prevent um, and protect future generations from HPV-related precancer symptoms and cancers in the future. Because as we know, HPV vaccination is cancer prevention. Next slide. So my name is Ashley Locke and I'm the HPV Program Manager for Geographic Disparities at the American Cancer Society. I have the honor of talking with you first, but I'm just one of many of this part, larger team that encompasses many of my colleagues from both the American Cancer Society and the National HP Vaccination Roundtable who work on increasing HP vaccinations every day. Next slide. So to get us started, I'd like to share a few general housekeeping items with you. So today's call is being recorded and the video and slides will be shared afterwards via email and be posted on our website, which I'll talk a little bit about later this call. Because we have extremely full agenda, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for sharing. So we're gonna rely heavily on the chat box for questions throughout the call. And as you have questions, please add them to the chat and we'll answer them throughout today's session. Our main room is being recorded, so if you don't wish to have your image recorded, please stay off video, and we will have a breakout session towards the end of today's call. However, we will not record that part of the session, and we encourage you to turn on your video and, um, and your mic and engage meaningfully during that time. You can also use your um, microphone button at the bottom left of your screen to turn it on and off, um, especially during breakouts to share. And lastly, if you have Zoom questions, we have the chat box open. We're all here to support you, but feel free to ping myself or my colleague, Kayla Monsalice, if you need assistance and we are available to help you as well. Next slide. As far as our roadmap for today, we started with our logistics. Here in a minute, you'll hear from one of our fearless leaders, Jennifer Conga, followed by, followed by Dr. Jane Montalegre from MD Anderson, who has new research published on the incidence of cervical cancer increasing in low income and rural areas. And then we'll wrap up with a short breakout to allow for some networking so we can all get to know each other better, digest what we heard from today's presentations, and then start talking through what we are currently doing around HPV vaccinations. Our ACS staff will help to facilitate these breakout discussions, and after breakouts, we'll come back to the main room, and I'll share some final items with you before we wrap up for the afternoon. Next slide. So before I hand it off to Jen, I did want to take a moment to see where everyone is calling in from. So for this specific component, you'll want to use your Zoom annotation, which you can either find a pen on your toolbar, or if you um, don't see that, you can also 
um, find the toolbar at the top that says view options and then select annotate. And you can collect, um, pick your favorite stamp and then click that location on the map that you're located from. And if you're having trouble, um, feel free to also add your location into the chat as well. And I see the screen is lighting up. That's great. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for all the participation. I am going to grab a quick screenshot. Perfect. All right. If we could just clear the screen really quickly, and if you're having trouble clearing it, you can just click the X on your screen. And then Hannah, if you want to go to the next slide. Perfect. So I'm happy to introduce um, Jennifer Conga. She is an HPV cancer prevention public health professional who spent the past eight years leading the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable in the Vaccinate Against Adolescents Against Cancers program at the American Cancer Society. She started at the American Cancer Society 14 years ago, working in the Midwest to grow and train a diverse volunteer base in supported regional efforts to champion the professional value of community health workers. She then spent three years in Florida leading a team that partnered with community health centers to improve cancer prevention through vaccination and screening. As um, leads for ACS's HP program to advance mission HP cancer free, she's a passionate champion for adolescent vaccination. Partnerships are at the heart of all the incredible programs she's been a part of during her ACS career, and we're excited to grow new relationships with your organizations through this new program. So I'm going to hand it over to Jen. Thanks, Ashley. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending where you're joining us from. It is truly an honor that you took this time to be with us today. Um, I have been here 14 years, as Ashley said, and in my lifetime, the fact that we have a cancer prevention vaccine is just beyond the dreams, right? So we're gonna be talking about HPV vaccination and why it's so important, especially in rural communities. But as I prepared for our conversation today, it allowed me to reflect a little bit on my own roots and where I come from. So I'm a very proud cheesehead. Liz in Wisconsin, I saw you. I grew up in a small town of 9,999 people, Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, halfway between Madison and Milwaukee. We call it the land of the five O's. That's downtown on the left side and the band shell up in the top right. We're on a nice summer night. You could catch a concert um, right on, on the beach. These are my people. This is where I'm from. These are my roots. My great grandparents um, immigrated from Germany, bought a farm in southeastern Wisconsin, grew up going to visit that farm in Uncle Gordy where my dad would go hunting. My This was in a small town called Sullivan, population 640-ish, um, which is also where my maternal grandparents lived. Grandma lived in a mobile home park and would drive into town 30 minutes um, for her health care. So health care in my family wasn't, we, we weren't um, exactly seeking out preventative care. My dad was a factory worker, um, so he was busy working, didn't take time for preventive care. Um, we would go to the doctor only when something was really wrong. My grandma, like I said, would drive in the 30 miles to town to see her provider. And that kind of became her retirement hobby of just going to visit her provider. And my mom has continued that tradition following her um, family doctor around almost the past 30 years as he moved out of our town into other practices and other places. I grew up being taught that you trusted your family doctor. You did what they said, you stuck with them. Um, we didn't really know about healthcare guidelines. We relied on Reader's Digest to tell us what to do or the family doc. Healthcare kind of only mattered when something wasn't going right. Well, times have changed and my hometown has grown. Those are my nieces in the upper left corner. I still make them go out on country bike rides with me sometimes. 
We have more access to information than ever. We have supercomputers in our pockets and there's a lot more healthcare sites and clinics, arguably than 40 to 50 years ago. But yet, how many families are you caring for that are like my dad, busy working, putting food on the table for their families, not wanting to take time off work or maybe not having enough money in the pocket to really want to spend that on health care. Or maybe they're like my grandma when she got to her early 80s and she couldn't drive anymore into town because it wasn't safe. Or maybe in your practice, you've lost a provider and now your patients have to drive further away for specialty care or they have to wait months on end to receive care. We want everyone, no matter where you live, to have access to preventative care. And that's why we're so excited to launch this learning community with you. Next slide. So our vision of the American Cancer Society is to end cancer as we know it for everyone. We're truly trying to address every cancer that affects every family through advocacy, research, and patient support. And in the case of HPV vaccination, again, we have a vaccine that prevents six cancers. Next slide. There is an unacceptably high burden of cancer in this country, and you're gonna be hearing more specifically about the impact of cervical cancer today. Next slide. So the program I've had the privilege of working with the last two years has been supported by the CDC, and we call it HPV Vax, Vaccinate Adolescents Against Cancer. And through our partnership work, we're seeking to improve HPV vaccination rates through partnership and close those care gap opportunities. Make sure no adolescent child ages 9 to 12 misses an opportunity to get vaccinated at their routine visits. Next slide. Our colleagues joining us on the call today from the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable bring the magic together through a national coalition of over 80 organizations, building the bridge between immunization and cancer prevention organizations to truly catalyze communities and states and regions to help accelerate the speed of which we're protecting populations. Next slide. So as I mentioned, ACS works with health systems, health plans. We have experienced doing learning collaboratives and learning communities for the past uh, three years for payer work. And I think we're upwards of five to seven years with health systems. We work with HPV coalitions across the country, state health leadership. It's integral to all of our HPV vaccination work. Next slide. And at the heart of this is a focus on community, I'm sorry, community improvement, yes, through quality improvement, right? How do we use data to Im improve our rate performance? Next slide. And at the heart of this is people who care in systems about making sure every patient in their care is fully protected to get on time HPV vaccination. And so, that quality improvement endeavor takes with leadership buy-in. It takes a team of committed people, usually with a super champion in the practice, supported by our ACS field team members, and building a culture around improving quality, improving our performance, especially in that adolescent HEDIS um, measure, right? That HEDIS IMA. Using data throughout the lifespan of the process uh, of the project to look at what can we accomplish specifically by December 31st, 2024, how can we help you and support your team in improving your HPV vaccine delivery through the implementation of evidence-based interventions? And you're gonna get lots of information over the, the course of this series on this. And then how do we sustain that success over time? Next slide. So the reason we wanna compel you as well to think about the importance of this vaccine amongst all of the many healthcare priorities that you face is that the pandemic, HPV has always been kind of the lower performer amongst adolescent vaccines, but the pandemic really upset this apple cart. There were over 8.4 million doses of HPV vaccination missed during the three years of the, of the core years of the pandemic. Missed. Next slide. 
industry experts and models have estimated that if we don't take urgent action, it could take three to 10 years for us to catch up on this missed vaccination gap. Next slide. As I mentioned, HPV vaccination, those orange and yellow lines on the bottom, orange being the, at least one dose, um, and this is NIS teen data, so survey of teenagers 13 to 17, yellow kind of being the lowest line of up-to-date for males and females. HPV is significantly lower in performance than meningococcal and tetanus diphtheria. Many of you know this. This is why you're here. Next slide. And we know that there is a huge gap in HPV vaccine delivery for one or more doses. That's consi consistently almost 10% um, points lower than national norms in urban areas. Next slide. And again, when we compare here, we're looking at um, MSA areas compared to non-MSA. We've got HPV over on the right and that teal bar being the lowest that's where we have all this room for improvement. So we're at, looks, you know, shy of 50% uh, for up-to-date vaccination uh, for non-MSA areas. So we have work to do, and that's why you're all here. So I know um, we're gonna pass this off. Thank you for taking this time. We hope you'll be with us the whole 10 part series. Ashley's got quite a, a curriculum plan for you. Um, and we're really excited to learn with you. So thank you again. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jen, for helping to create a great stage and for helping to um, allow participants to understand more about the American Cancer Society and the National HP Vaccination Roundtable's um, HP vaccination work. If you wanna to go to the next slide. So I am now happy to turn it over um, to Dr. Jane Montalegre from MD Anderson. Just a little bit about Dr. Montalegre. She's an associate professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. She is a behavioral epidemiologist and implementation scientist with research expertise in the design, implementation, and evaluation of community and health system-based interventions to address cancer health disparities. Much of her research focuses on the prevention and detection of cervical and other human papilloma, hope, human papilloma virus associated cancers in underserved and minority populations. She is a PD of two continuously funded CPRIT prevention programs that target um, safety net health systems and aim to one, increase access to and utilization of cervical and colorectal cancer screening and follow up among adult patients, and two, increase delivery and uptake of HPV vaccination and tobacco prevention services among pre-adolescent and adolescent patients. Um, Jane also collaborates on a grant to increase HP vaccination coverage in rural areas along the U.S.-Mexican border through school-based vaccination programs. Jane, it's your, um, your turn. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a real joy for me to be here. Um, and I will talk about an increase that we're seeing in cervical cancer, but I do want to put this in the light of the control and like the previous slide said, potential elimination of HPV associated cancers, a future that I think is well within our reach. Next slide. Next, sorry. Ooh, I didn't realize there was animation. <laughs> I don't have any disclosures. Next. So as you all know very well, um, HPV causes six different types of cancers. And we often hear that cervical cancer is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, next slide. Um, and gl globally, we can see that um, cervical cancer is quite a very big tip of the iceberg. Um, on the left, we have overall HPV associated cancers among males and females. And then on the right, we have among females um, and in the middle males. Um, and so cervix cancer really is one of the, or, or is the predominant HPV associated cancer. Um, next slide. In the United States, um, we see that cervix cancer remains one of the major um, HPV-associated cancers, but unlike uh, globally, 
where I should have pointed out previously, but oropharyngeal cancer is just a small sliver at the bottom, really um, outperformed by cervix. We actually see that in the United States, oropharynx cancer has surpassed cervix cancer. Um, next slide. So today I'm gonna to talk about cervix cancer because cervix cancer can be prevented through HPV vaccination, just as the other, um, other five uh, HPV associated cancers. But we also have tools for screening, early detection and treatment of precancerous lesions, what makes it possible for us to truly think about eliminating cervical cancer. And yet right now the burden of cervical cancer is extremely high. I don't think the graphs do justice to the fact that we have a new diagnosis every minute. Um, among um, people across the globe, and, and every two minutes, a death due to cervix cancer. Next slide. But like I said, we do have elimination at hand because of our three-pronged strategy that we can use um, for cervix cancer, which globally and in the United States um, involves um, vaccinating um, against HPV, which we know can prevent 90% of HPV-associated cancers. Um, and then we also need to screen 70% or higher of the population in the United States. We set our goal to 90% and I'll show you why. And um, also making sure that 90% of people who are identified to have cervical disease receive treatment, either for those precancers or for those cancers. And very excitingly, if we do this as humanity, as a world, we will be able to achieve elimination of cervix cancer as a public health problem which is defined as an incidence of less than four per 100,000 uh, people per year, person years, um, we will be able to achieve um, this elimination within the next 100 years. Next slide. I think, I think there's much cause for optimism in the United States. Uh, our modeling exercises, well, not our, I would say collectively um, as researchers, but this is done by um, Berger et al. Um, uh, uh, modeling has shown that the United States can eliminate cervix cancer as a public health problem within the next two to three decades, which is really exciting. And of course, HPV vaccination is going to get us there ultimately. And we really need to make sure that those vaccination efforts are important. Um, I also want to point out that cer cervical cancer screening would have the opportunity to really accelerate um, how soon we can eliminate cervix cancer. If we were to uh, also screen 90% of the population, we can actually accelerate that elimination by 10 to 13 years. Next slide. And so we really need to scale up our efforts, both on vaccination and screening. Um, as I, I think many of you all know, we really have reached this um, sort of this bottom valley um, that is quite flat over the past uh, couple of decades. So we used to see um, following the introduction of mass uh, screening that we had this massive in, uh, reduction in cervical cancer mortality and incidence. Um, however, that really stopped around the turn of the, uh, the millennia, the century um, in the early 2000s in which we really started to plateau in terms of our mortality rates um, from cervix cancer as well as our incidence rates, which are shown um, in, the, in the next graph on the right. Next slide. And, and most importantly, I, um, the data I'm gonna show you today really show that not only do we need to scale up our prevention efforts with vaccination and screening, but we also really need to ensure that they are equitably accessed by the population. Um, because like Ashley asked me to talk about today, we actually have seen that in this indicator disease, cervical cancer, for which we have HPV vaccination and screening, we are actually seeing that cervix cancer is no longer decreasing um, across the board in the United States. And in fact, we have increasing uh, incidence among individuals living in low income counties. Uh, next slide. Furthermore, these are the, the disparities um, are important here. We actually see, um, next slide, that the increasing trends, um, sorry, that overall we have a we have um, flattening cervix cancer incidence. Next slide. But in, among non-Hispanic white women living in low-income counties, 
um, we see that there's an actual increase of 1% per year. Next slide. And among Hispanic uh, uh, women living in low-income counties, we have a, a non-significant 0.5% increase per year. Next slide. What most concerning is that we're not seeing that these are early stage diagnoses, but we're really seeing that this is really in distant stage diagnoses when it comes to increasing cervix cancer among low income uh, persons. And we see close to, uh, over a 4% increase per year among non-Hispanic white women living in low income counties. And I regret that we don't have these analyses because the numbers become quite slow, small, um, but but we hypothesize and really our data, I think, are starting to show when we do alternative analyses looking at rurality, that a lot of this is actually being driven by rural poor counties. Next slide. And furthermore, not only is it in the late stage disease, which is also very concerning, but we also see that mortality in cervix cancer, which, like I said, has been quite flat for the past 20 years, we're actually also seeing that uh, increase among non-Hispanic Black women in the past uh, several years amongst those living in low-income counties. Next slide. Like I said, cervix cancer is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and if we look at all HPV-associated cancers, um, we can see that the, 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 the sheer number of them is increasing across the board. So we have um, more cervix cancer cases reported among older white women and older Black women as well as Hispanic women of all ages. And we're also seeing that just the sheer number of anal, oropharyngeal, vaginal, and vulvar cancers is also increasing in all age and racial ethnic groups. And while oropharyngeal cancer surpassed cervix cancer overall as the main HPV associated cancer in the United States, we also see that anal cancer has surpassed cervical cancer among older white women. And so there really is um, both increasing cervix cancer but also these other HPV associated cancers that we're going to see a huge rise in. Um, next slide. And while I said we don't have the data from our analyses looking at those low income counties to look at whether they are rural um, or urban, um, we have done separate analyses that show that really this seems to be driven by uh, rural areas. And I want to point out this really important publication, and I just realized I don't have the citation, but it's the, at, the, at the end, that shows that it seems like most increases across HPV-associated cancers, be it oropharyngeal or anal, um, or uh, really are driven and are mostly occurring amongst rural populations. So if you can see the percent change um, and the annual percent change um, across uh, the board, you can see that they are significantly higher among rural persons than those living in urban counties. Next slide. Um, and so where are we now in terms of prevention? We have these amazing tools to prevent uh, both cervix cancer um, as well as HPV vaccination to pr promote, uh, to, to prevent all HPV associated cancers. So where are we? Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we can expedite time to elimination by 10 to 13 years by achieving 90% coverage. And yet we see that screening coverage has actually declined quite significantly um, in the past uh, couple of decades. So in 2005, we had 14% of uh, persons needing a cervical cancer screening test um, being underscreened or not up to date with their cervical cancer screening guidelines. And that increased to 23% who were not up to date in 2019. And furthermore, the disparities are quite profound um, with most people being who are overdue for cervical cancer screening being racial ethnic minoritized populations and those specifically who are uninsured. And we also see um, important rural urban disparities. Next slide. In terms of the HPV vaccine, we're making very steady progress. Um, and that's because of efforts like the ones that you are all engaged in and your amazing work. Um, but we're still below the Healthy People 2030 target of 80%. Next slide. 
and the disparities remain significant. And as we know, those disparities seem to be widening or seem to have widened um, with, with the COVID-19 dropout in HPV vaccination coverage. And we can see specifically that the uninsured teens and preteens were the ones who suffered the most um, with, um, with COVID pandemic and in the years thereafter. Next slide. We also see that there are very important socioeconomic disparities in addition to being uninsured, um, but also in terms of uh, poverty levels and educational status. Next slide. And um, as, uh, as was pointed out previously, we know that those living in non-metropolitan areas, those living in rural areas are significantly less likely to be up to date with their HPV vaccine. Next slide. But I want to leave this on a positive note um, because our efforts are paying off um, significantly and they will continue to pay off. These are data from the President's Cancer Panel, which um, put together several indicators of our efforts on HPV associated cancer. And it's, I think, really important to point out that in our vaccine era, we've had a 71% decrease in HPV infections in the cervix amongst females ages 14 to 19 years old. We've also seen a 59% decrease in cervical precancers in, those, in, in the vaccine era. And oral HPV vaccinations, which is something else we can um, monitor, has, um, is 88% lower um, amongst uh, those who are vaccinated versus those who are unvaccinated. And, and more importantly, next slide, on a global scale, we're seeing really encouraging and wonderful evidence. This is a paper that just came out um, uh, at the end of last, uh, sorry, at the beginning of this year. And this is from Scotland in which they showed that amongst vaccinated women, no cervical cancers in, were detected amongst women in Scotland. Um, and this is really being seen in other countries where the vaccine rates are high, where they're not detecting cervical cancer cases any longer. And so our efforts surely will and are already paying off. Next slide. But as in closing, it's important that we scale up those efforts and truly eliminate those disparities, which is the work that you all are doing. And I'm very happy uh, to, to kick off today with this um, uh, introduction and stage setting. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Montalegre, for sharing your experience and your research um, in trends in cervical cancer screenings and diagnoses. You really did help to set the stage on why we need to focus um, on HP vaccinations, especially in those rural communities. So we are now going to have a short Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna ask participants if they would like to come off mute, if you wanna raise your hand or feel free to type some questions in the chat for both Jen and Dr. Montalegre. Um, I'm looking to see if we have anything quite yet. Doesn't look like it, but um, I do have some questions for the two of you. Um, so Dr. Montalegre, um, I know both cervical cancer screening and HP vaccination guidelines have changed over time. I guess, um, where do you see both of them in the next decade? Yeah, really, really great question. Um, I think we're really at an exciting time. I just got back from a conference where there was a lot of buzz about the single dose vaccine. And I think that will soon become a reality, um, which will be monumental in terms of expanding access, particularly particularly to hard to reach populations. As I know all of um, the members of this um, collaborative know of getting kids in for that second dose is often times um, the most challenging. Um, and so the promise of a single dose vaccine, I think really will bring us a significantly closer to reaching our vaccine targets. And in terms of um, screening, we're also at a really exciting time. And this is something else that the American Cancer Society is working on through the National Roundtable for Cervical Cancer Screening is transitioning from our traditional pap smear, um, which is a visual test, um, to um, looking for actually having tests for HPV itself, which is more precise and more sensitive. Um, and, and, and importantly, um, has a promise of also uh, being able to be done by persons themselves. Um, so hopefully that will be um, 
quite monumental in terms of removing a lot of access barriers, such as those that we see all the time in uh, like in the rural United States where people, um, like Jen pointed out, you know, have a really hard time coming in to see their providers. Um, so I think both on the screening side and the vaccination time, we're on a, a clear path to having the tools we need to really scale up our efforts. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, another question. So what best practices can the U.S. learn from countries like Australia, United Kingdom, and Scotland who are well on their way to eliminating cervical cancer? Wow. Yeah. Great questions. Um, I think this is something that you all will be talking about in the collaborative, but I think we really need to be thinking about ways that we can expand access for populations who might not be coming in to see their provider regularly. And so we, we've talked about sort of, um, you know, what is currently considered unconventional settings. Um, so really engaging pharmacies, um, perhaps engaging dental providers. And like our work along the U.S.-Mexico border has really shown a lot of promise for working with schools and school districts um, to vaccinate um, on site at schools and using the relationship that families have with their school nurses um, to make the vaccine more available there. Um, uh, you know, globally, um, there has been a lot of success with school-based vaccination, and I'm hoping that um, we can see a place for that um, where school nurses, I can see, yes, I see a school nurse in the chat. Um, school nurses are so trusted in their communities by parents. I'm really hoping that we can adopt some of the best practices from international settings and really do more to engage school nurses um, and school settings as uh, central places in their communities. Perfect. Um, I'm looking at the chat. We did have one question come in about cost of the vaccine. I don't know, um, Jane or Jen, if you want to answer this, um, but any resources for, for patients where cost is a barrier? I would just add that the Vaccine for Children's program um, makes the vaccine available to any child in the United States without insurance or underinsured up to the age of 18. Um, there are also other programs for um, ages 19 to 26 um, that usually uh, can be made available either through um, pharmaceutical companies or health departments. So that's something to uh, inquire about locally. It is a vaccine recommended by ACIP, so it, it should be um, covered by all insurance providers, but sometimes there may be a copay, but there really shouldn't be. Perfect. Um, and Jane, so one of the participants said that they're a pediatric nurse um, and they struggle to get parents to accept the need for the HPV vaccine. I don't know if you have any thoughts or some things that you've learned in your research. Yeah, this is something we hear about. Parents really, it's hard to as a parent, I have a nine and 11 year old and, you know, it's hard to think of your kids as being adult at some point. Um, <laughs> and so it's really hard to, to, I think sometimes for parents to see sort of that immediate um, risk. Um, but I think, you know, clearly the, the research is showing that the messaging like the American Cancer Society has about, you know, vaccinating against cancer, you know, having a lifelong uh, protection against cancer, um, and really stressing the importance of of the cancer um, is as I think just the most important um, uh, in our practice. And then the other thing has really been, um, I think, in on our research is showing um, a lot of the times parents aren't necessarily opposed to it unless it's pointed out separately. Um, and so, really doing a bundling approach where you're just recommending um, that your child, uh, th that their child get vaccinated with the, you know, the standard either adolescent or childhood vaccines um, and sort of doing a bundled approach where HPV vaccine isn't singled out. So it's not bringing up an additional conversation um, because I think, uh, you know, Jen showed in her, her, her slides, you know, parents somehow don't question men uh, the meningococcal or the Tdap um, vaccine. And that's because it's sort of just presented as a usual childhood vaccine. And so I think we really need to change our messaging, both to cancer prevention, as well as just one of the routine vaccines. Perfect. Um, 
Jane, there was a question. Is there a timeline for the single dose vaccine to be approved for use in the U.S.? Oh, that's a really good question. I um, I don't know what the timeline is for the United States. There's currently um, a large study that's been going on that has shown that the effectiveness is the same um, for a single dose versus multiple doses. I'm sorry, that's not true. <laughs> the, 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 the immune response is, is different, but the re immune response um, for both is higher than what is needed to prevent um, cancers and precancers. So yes, in, in essence, it is quite the same. It is the equally effective in terms of uh, preventing disease. And so the evidence is there. Um, but I think, you know, there's a huge process in the United States that has to take place. Um, WHO has already um, endorsed uh, a single dose um, for most populations um, globally if there's um, if there's access um, and cost barriers. Um, but still, the preference is to use two doses because there are certain populations that do require additional doses, such as those who are immunocompromised, HIV positive, and whatnot. And so I think I would love if I knew the answer, but I think the United States is wading through all of the pros and cons of what that change would look like and, and how to get there. But I do think it is on the horizon. Perfect. Um, we did have a question. So some dentists can screen for um, oral or pharyngeal cancers, gynae screen for cervical. How is the rectum screened? Yeah, excellent question. So there are, this. so um, actually, just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, um, there were guidelines uh, that were released for anal cancer screening, um, anal rectal cancer screening. And the reason is that there was a monumental study that that showed that if we treat um, precancerous lesions of the anus and rectum, we can prevent cancer. And so, of course, when you're screening, one of the requirements for a screening program is that you can do something about it, right? We don't wanna screen if we can't do anything about it. Um, and so now that we've established that if we treat uh, precancerous lesions in the anus and rectum, we can prevent cancer. Now there's a whole new movement for guidelines. And we just had, yes, thank you so much. We knew we have new guidelines um, coming out for anal rectal cancer um, uh, for certain populations. And that this will be expanded, I think, in the future as the data come in for other populations as well. Perfect. Um, one last question. Uh, are there any adverse reactions to the HP vaccine? Uh, I just yeah. put a link in. Thank you. That, that And that's for you, Jen. <laughs> that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our favorite scholars um, likes to say there's been um, over 20 years, uh, like 100 million um, people studied, 100 million doses and over, uh, what is it, Jane, 20, 30, 50 studies. It is one of the safest, most studied vaccines in the, in the history of any vaccine available. Um, so it is a safe and effective vaccine. And we'll be providing you, there's so many good questions in here that we're not gonna be able to cover today, but over the course of this series, we're gonna get to a lot of these topics around um, vaccine hesitation, um, making sure that we have provider um, messaging and talking points, care team approach. There'll be so much that'll be covered in this series. Perfect. Well, I wanna thank everyone for engaging in our Q&A and asking such great questions. Um, I wanna thank Jane and Dr. I'm sorry, Jen and Dr. Montalegri again for being a part of um, today's um, today's meeting and presentation and for helping us to really set the stage. Um, so if we wanna to go to the next slide. So we have about 15 minutes left, a little less. Um, so we are gonna go into our breakouts for about 12 minutes. Um, and network amongst each other. Once again, I want to encourage you guys to come on camera and come off mute to converse amongst each other. So just to give some quick instructions, I'm going to have all of you share your name, your health system, your state, and then use this time to really talk through some of the things you heard, um, talk through some things you might be doing to increase HP vaccinations or what challenges you might be facing. We may not get to everyone, but um, our ACS staff members will help to facilitate discussion so many of you can share. So Melissa, if you want to go ahead and push us into breakouts.
I'm sorry, Ashley. Ashley, are you out there? I'm here. I'm so sorry. I was on mute. Um, well, hi, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that short breakout session. It sounds like everyone had really robust conversations. I know my group did. I hope you're able to meet um, some new folks and share some ideas amongst each other. Um, so we are going to wrap up today's session and talk through next steps. Um, Hannah, if you want to go to the next slide. So I'm excited to share we've built an external facing website for all our participants in the rural HP vaccination learning community to be able to access all the resources that we will share during our 10 month journey. Um, this will include recordings and slide decks from our monthly sessions. Um, my colleague Kayla is actually going to add a link into the chat and I highly recommend you bookmark the website so you can access it at any time. If you want to go to the next slide. So on the top of the web page under important links, you'll see we've placed important documents like our program overview, registration link, both the ACS and the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable's parent and patient facing resources on HPV vaccinations. And we also put the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable's rural summary from the um, highlighting some of the important um, opportunities for increasing HPV vaccinations. If you wanna to go to the next slide. And then as you scroll down on that web page, you'll also find we have our program background, we have upcoming dates and topics, and this is where we will link recordings and materials from previous sessions. We also have pre-populated the website with resources on parent and patient, patient education materials, clinical educa education materials where you can find CE opportunities for clinical staff, pharmacists, and even dental professionals. We've linked some of our quality improvement resources we'll provide to partners. And lastly, we've also included some of our impact reports from American Cancer Society, as well as the National HP Vaccination Roundtable. So you can see how we do our work. If you wanna to go to the next slide. And this slide is really just going to highlight some of the QI resources um, that we have shared on the website. And we're gonna talk heavily about these in future sessions, but wanted you to have access now in case you're already starting your quality improvement journey to increasing HP vaccinations. These documents can be really helpful as you start making that plan. If you want to go to the next slide. So this quickly reviews our schedule for the next 10 months. We'll be meeting again in just a few short weeks on April 10th, where we're going to hear from Dr. Robert Bernardcheck from Emory University, and we will be deep diving into HPV vaccination data, because we know that data is one of the most important elements of a quality improvement project, and we, we really need to know where we're going in order to know, or we need to know where we are starting in order to know where we're going, so... Additionally, I do want to note we had um, a slight change for our June meeting. So instead of meeting on June 19th, we've actually pushed up the date to June 12th. And please look for our calendar invite, um, an updated calendar invite after this call. If you go to the last slide. Um, so I do want to end with just some next steps. I encourage you, one, not only to look at our website, um, which I'll have ask Kayla if you could link that once again in the chat, but please bookmark it for future use. And as we prepare for our April session, I ask that you explore your organization's HP vaccination policy, find out if you're capable of pulling your HP vaccination data and what source you might wanna use, whether that's your EMR, your state immunization registry, or a combo of different sources. And lastly, maybe you might not even be able to, maybe you might even be able to pull your baseline data. So um, if you can do that, you may want to look to see where you're at and where there's opportunity in the different age groups, the different doses, or even genders. And then the last slide. Um, so we want to know how today went and what you really liked about it and what we could do better. So my colleague Kayla just added a link to the chat. Um, please click this link and complete it after we close out our Zoom. Let us know anything you want to learn for future sessions. If you're interested in sharing a best practice or a challenge, we want to make this learning community a positive learning experience and keep it relevant to each of you. So um, 
you know, let's um, please feel free to share your, your feedback with us. And thank you again for joining today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care and we will be following up with you here shortly.